So welcome to this educational session on the draft ESRS E3 Water and Marine uh, Resources. I will uh, try to walk you through uh, this uh, standard, this draft standard uh, today. And before we deep dive into the standards, I would just like to, to start with a few um, statistics from the European Environment Agency State of the Environment Report for 2020, which states that uh, water demand is set to increase by 55% uh, by 2050. Uh, that 40% of marine environments are now severely uh, altered, and also that uh, EU water abstraction has decreased by uh, 90% between 1994 and 2015, which is good news, and 89% of bodies of water have achieved good quantitative status, uh, but only 40% of bodies of water have achieved good ecological status uh, in terms of quality and 38% a good chemical quality status. Um, just this to remind us all how much important is this topic around uh, around water and uh, how much it is also linked to the river basin and to the loca local um, areas. So if we move first to the EU legal framework, uh, important to, to remind that um, these draft standards arise from the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive at the top, uh, which states uh, that the standards uh, shall cover uh, water in particular and marine resources, which is why those two subtopics are addressed in these standards. It's also one of the key topics from the SFDR principal adverse indicators. Uh, there is emissions to water in those, but uh, which is uh, rather addressed in the standard on pollution. And then for um, PAA around water usage and recycling, investment in companies without management policies, exposure to areas of high water stress, and investment in companies without sustainable oceans. So all those four PAI have been integrated in the standard. It is also a key topic and one of the six objectives of the EU taxonomy, um, the regulation 2028-52. Uh, so it's really one key piece uh, of uh, information which is already addressed in the sustainable finance policy in general from the European Commission. And so it was the, uh, an important uh, and material matter to address. Uh, regarding the objective of the standard, it's really about how the uh, water and marine resources impact, risk and opportunities of uh, the company and how they affect the company and how the company affects water and marine resources. Also, um, what are the plans and capacity of the other thinking to adapt its strategy and business model to these impact, risk and opportunities that have been identified? And what are the nature, the type, and the extent of those um, IRO impact risk and opportunities? Um, having in mind that we always go to the financial effect in all environmental standards of those IROs over the short, medium, and long term. If we go in the details of impact risk and opportunities management, so here, Regarding materiality assessment, this disclosure requirement really has to be uh, understood and read as a complement to ESRS 2, with some elements which have been added, but most importantly, some guidance on the next slide here around the LEAP approach, which needs to be considered by uh, the undertaking to lead their materiality assessment. The first pillar is around the location of uh, the impact, the, the dependency, the risk and opportunities with a specific focus on the location of areas at risk. An importance, of course, of the sectors or business units that uh, have to be considered and how they interface with the location of areas at risk. In terms of areas at risk, it can be quantity risk with high water stress, for instance, and a qualitative risk regarding the status and the quality of the river basin to be considered. 
once this first step of material elements um, regarding the location have been identified, we move to this next step, which is to evaluate uh, and identify the impacts and dependency of the business process along the value chain and assessing the severity and likelihood of impact on water and marine, marine resources. And then we move to the materiality assessment of those impacts and dependencies to identify really the risks and opportunity with um, some elements on transition risk, physical risk and opportunities, the consideration of a life cycle assessment, which can help identifying and assessing these uh, risk and opportunities and some tools that have been provided and that may be considered by the undertaking. And we move to the possible outcome of this um, materiality assessment with a list of geographical areas, a list of marine resources related commodities and a list of sectors associated to water and marine resources material arrows. When we move to policies, actions and resources, so it's important to have in mind that those policies have to be um, disclosed when they address uh, the identification, assessment, management and remediation of material and material is key, water related impact, risk and opportunities. We don't expect to see any policy if on, on aspects in water which are not material, only material ones are relevant here. And then the undertaking shall indicate whether and how its policies address a number of areas that are detailed. Water management, product and service design and the commitment to reduce in absolute value the material water consumptions, in particular in areas at water risk uh, in its own operation and along the upstream and downstream value chain. And here I emphasize again, it is only a whether and how the policies that have been adopted address those um, different topics. There may be other topics, other areas that the undertaking uh, choose to address in the target and they may be described and not all those areas may be covered by the targets, uh, by the policies. There are also two other elements which are linked to SFDRPAA uh, to be disclosed in a mandatory uh, manner, uh, which are the policies in relation to sites which are located in an area of high water stress. Uh, and the policies or practices related to sustainable oceans and sea. Regarding actions and resources, it is really the same um, the same architecture. So it's linked to the policies that have been implemented, which are themselves linked to the material IRO. So here we will again expect only actions and resources in relation to those material impact, risk and opportunity. And the undertaking shall specify, if it's the case, to which layer in the mitigation hierarchy and action and resources can be allocated. So to this mitigation hierarchy, so to start with avoid the use of marine resources, so basically really de decrease as much as possible, reduce the use of water and marine resources and restore, regenerate and transform marine ecosystems and basins. The undertaking shall also specify actions and resources in relation to areas at water risk, including areas of high water stress. Um, important also, it's in the application requirements uh, that water and marine resources are obviously shared resources and they may often require collective action. So the undertaking is really invited to uh, provide information on those specific collective action that um, it may have implemented. We now move to the metrics and targets uh, section. So for targets, it follows again the same architecture. We start from the arrow, we move to policies, we move to action plans, and then we set targets in relation also to the metrics uh, that are provided in uh, the standards. And the undertaking shall indicate whether and how the targets relate to the management of material impact, risk and opportunities, the responsible management of marine resources impact, and the reduction of water consumption. There is also this reference to ecological thresholds. It was deemed very important, first because it's mentioned in the CSRD that uh, for environmental targets, we need scientific evidence. And so here the undertaking um, is um, 
is invited to, to provide information um, on the ecological threshold that it, uh, it may have uh, considered. So, for instance, on water, it's obvious, again, that it's a shared resource. So it's important to have in mind what is the capacity, for instance, of a river basin to absorb a certain number of um, stakeholders and volume of consumption in a given area. So that's a way of considering the ecological thresholds regarding to water. When we move to, to metrics, the first uh, and the, the big main category of metrics is really around the conception of water. So you see there is a total water consumption uh, in cubic meter. Then this consumption in the areas at material water risk, including areas of high water stress. So now let's move to water consumption, which is DRE3.4 which is really the, the, the main um, category of KPA for this standard. It's also linked to the fact that this was the key one to be sector agnostic. For instance, water discharges and water withdrawals were considered, but were finally concluded to be sector specific. So they are still included as uh, optional disclosure requirements in the application require in the application requirements in the guidance, but they are no more required as such um, for all undertaking. So. What SFDRPAI require is the total water consumption in cubic meter per net revenue, which also derived that we need the water consumption per se and the water recycled and reused in cubic meters. On top of it, um, has been added the water consumption in cubic meter in areas at material material water risk, including areas of high water stress, because again, water is first a location um, issue. And the, the local aspects are very important, so it was deemed necessary to have this understanding. And uh, well, it's also required the total water stored and changes in storage in cubic meters, meters which is also a metric from um, GRI. There is no metric regarding marine resources, um, as I explained before, that's really related to the fact that marine uh, resources was deemed sector specific, mostly. Uh, and so the materiality assessment is very key, and it is really important that uh, all undertakings considered marine resources, marine commodities, when leading the materiality assessment, but it was not deemed relevant to require a specific metric on uh, marine resources. Important also, uh, sometimes uh, as much important as the metric is the contextual information related to the above metric, including uh, regarding the local basins, water quality and quantity, how the data have been compiled, such as uh, any standards, methodologies and exceptions used. Uh, that is really key uh, to be able to understand the metrics in the proper manner. And finally, the last piece is around the potential financial effects from water and marine resources. So these financial effects are required for all environmental standards. There is no specificity uh, regarding water. So the objective is really to understand um, how the risks identified and the opportunities may have an influence on the undertaking's cash flows, performance, position, development, cost of capital, or access to finance over the short, medium, and long-term horizon. And the disclosure shall include a quantification of the potential financial effects in monetary terms or where impracticable uh, qualitative information. Also, a description of the effects considered the related impact and the time horizon in which they are likely to materialize. The disclosure shall include a quantification of the potential financial effects in monetary terms or where impracticable quantitative information, a description of the effects considered and the related impact and time horizons in which they are likely to materialize and the critical assumptions used in the estimate, as well as the sources and level of uncertainty attached to those assumptions. There is also a, a transitional provision regarding this disclosure requirement, 
uh, which leaves three years uh, for um, the undertaking to get to quantitative uh, information. So for the first three years, only qualitative information would be required. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I hope um, this session has helped you better understand the way ESRS E3 is structured. Thank you.